good. How are you, Trev? All right, cool, man. Waz, what's up, man? Dude, have we met? Okay, first, this is Waz and Kevin from <laughs> from the band Plum. Okay, um, now, Waz, did we ever met? Probably did. Uh, would I remember? Definitely not. That, that, that's that's <laughs> just a credit to my, my drunk, hedonistic days of being in... Uh, in and around the fringes of lithium so, so absolutely did, yeah so we probably did but shit i can't remember to be honest i mean i've got the posters of you guys um in the lineup with lithium mine there's plum there's god that was looking yeah. at a poster the other day and i was like shit you know i can remember mine um because obviously i've been i've been in talks with uh farrell and and, and obviously you and uh, is it kevin and farrell that yeah you, you've been talking yeah, about doing a project together right? well we we did a project actually. oh okay that's Okay. That's how this whole thing uh, got, got to to be uh, us being in contact with each other. So, yeah. Carl and I did an album about 2006 or 2007. Oh, okay. there and and uh, will that ever be released? Well, it... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> it will. So we did print copies. It was actually officially released, but again, you know, it was before things were getting uploaded. So a, a couple hundred CDs were printed. We did a few gigs with the with the lineup, and then I think that was that. Ooh. So, Wes, tell me, are you, are you excited about um, the album um, All and Nothing finally coming out on digital? Absolutely. I actually am, actually. Yeah. What um, took you so long? Why, why did it take so long? To get it up on a digital platform? Yeah. Um, everything with Plum took time. <laughs> <laughs> we always, uh, we, we took our time doing things and maybe that is the reason. I think that because we were possibly not a non-active live band, we kind of, you know, like Plum always um, took pride on our on, on our live shows. It was always something that we, 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 we dedicated so much time to rehearsing. It was always a big thing for us to rehearse and get the, the rehearsal, the, the sound live as close as we could get it on any sort of recording. And I think possibly to answer your question uh, in hindsight maybe is that because we weren't an active live band in the no. art, I think we just kind of pushed it under the, 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 the carpet and it was like, yeah, well, you know, we're not playing live anymore. And it was actually quite a, an ignorant part, part from our side. Uh, it's not like the music shouldn't be shared. It's not like we were being selfish about it. I just think we were ignorant to the fact even to put it up. I don't think there was a conscious effort Decision. to put it up or yeah. not to put it up, yeah. I agree 100%. I think we, we we always focus so much on the gigs and every gig had to have a unique set list and we, you know, we, we were so focused on what we delivered on stage. And then we recorded this album, toured it, and somehow the band ended just at that point. And uh, because we weren't gigging, we just felt like, oh, well, it's done. And now in hindsight, no, nah, it, it exists. It's, a, it's an album we put a lot of effort into, and it should be available. And now it is. Thanks, Trevor. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, a, it's a pleasure. It, it, you can thank Farrell because it, it was yeah. his sort of, you know, sort of like edging me on, like, you know, get in touch. And I remember David as well, David Beretta Owens from Lithium saying, Hey, the guys from Plum, I've been talking to Kevin and, and I was like, Plum, what is it? Damn it, that name. And I was like, look, again, looking at the post, I was like, oh shit, that Plum. Yeah. Oh, and I went yeah. on the internet to try and find stuff, but there was nothing. <laughs> but I'm, at least we're at the point now where you are visible on Facebook. You've, you've yes. got, got me helping you guys, which I'm very, very thankful for. Thank you very much. And we're getting your stuff out there and, and that's awesome. Now the question yeah. is, if you had to go back what one thing would you change? Anyone? You can take it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think everybody, I think everybody on, uh, you know, the three of us would have different points of reference of what we would change. For me, there's quite a few things I would change, Trev. <laughs> um, when we first got signed to um, Tick Tick Band to, to release our first album, we went back into so so in order to get signed to tick tick bang we had to produce a demo and we we recorded quite a few awesome demos you know and and there's something about a crisp recording or a, f a fresh spirit of a recording with new tracks and everything mm. that always prevails this the spirit of creativity that does lose itself for me when uh it's overproduced or uh, um and so anyway, we got signed to Tick Tick Bang to do a, 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 a EP, an EP. And what we should have done is taken the tracks that we had recorded already and maybe just remastered them. But what we landed up doing 
was going to a studio in Melville and blowing all the budget that we had to to record an EP. And what actually just came out was two tracks and a remix and a, and a hidden track called Jump Back. Uh, the, the EP was called Jump Back. And for me, that's definitely one thing I would have changed. I would have used, I think we had called the album to get signed. I think it was Ping Pong or Kev can correct me. It might have been a group of demos before that. I'm not, I can't remember. But that, when I listen to it today, is that's what should have been released. And I think it would have put us on a different platform. It would have given us a little bit of a head start as opposed to uh, an, an EP that was a little bit overproduced for me and as well as it was just uh it could have been more fresh right that's one thing yeah. i've got a few yeah. i'll let kev answer it <laughs> no, because <laughs> he's going way back so uh, if i remember correctly the ping pong and all that you're talking about was those were the cassettes we made some cassettes as plum just using a little eight track recorder in the band room essentially uh, which we sold on the road i remember selling them at opi copy and that and then we we put our heads together and, and we actually got a dat machine and, and we recorded this ep it's a six or seven track ep which we took to uh tick tick bang and i still remember gary the the um the head of tick tick bang saying well we can just release this and yeah. i think the one thing i would change is that we were we were maybe just too scared to let stuff go it never sounded yeah. the way we wanted and then we, we said no we want to re-record it and we got into a different studio and under a different vibe and came out with something that they had now spent all this money on we had to release it but actually didn't quite match even the demo we did ourselves. Yeah. And when, when uh, was when the, I listened to sorry, sorry, I was so, say, yeah, it, when was the demo with these these demos that you're talking about? What what year was that? Wow, nineties. Mm. Early nineties? Close I can give you no no no. Uh, we only started was, climb I think after ninety five, so this right. would be late nineties. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think so, it was ninety eight, ninety nine that was yeah. released. Yeah. You know, for, for me as well, just to, to highlight what Kev said is that um, we had so many tracks, Trevor, and it was so hard for us to release things because as Plum as a band, we always thought we could do the tracks better. We took it too, for me, I think we took it too personal. We always, because, because we were kind of like recording the tracks ourselves and Kev is a brilliant engineer and that, like that's where he comes from and, and, and we had the ability to just go in and record. You know, we always thought we could do it better. We could get a better bass drum sound. We could get a bass, better bass sound. We could get a better snare, like whatever the case was. Yeah. And we just carried on re-recording the same tracks and we just never released them, you know, in its entirety. It, it was like this constant battle with ourselves, you know, even to be honest, uh, All and Nothing is a complete history of Plum from 1996 to 2004, whenever it was released. It is a conglomerate of songs that we had picked up over the years that we finally sat down and said, cool, these are the tracks that are going on the album. I mean, Lifetime Partner was the first track, that, that's the second track on, 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 on the album. It was the first track we had ever written as well recorded and released really kev was talking about the demo tapes that we that we sold when we were on the road and that was what that was one of them you know? one of the songs of them yeah one of the songs in there and lifetime partners on that album so all all and nothing is a complete history of of some of the tracks that we had with plum that we chose to release it. I mean, we should have released so much more if, if i and usually before i do these these chat things or podcasts whatever you want to call them i'd I like, like to listen back to uh, the album and give me some sort of mental reference as to the band and like that and it's quite an eclectic bunch of tracks it's very different it's 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 something uh, that stands up today i think that is another reason maybe why um we struggled a bit as a band was because we were quite schizophrenic and <laughs> we wanted to be a metal band and a rap hip-hop sort of outfit with some trip-hop elements and sometimes this and sometimes that and that's very hard to to nail down uh, not just in studio but just in general and i think that's also why the live show was maybe something that we enjoyed putting out there because we did surprise people the way we could jump from one genre to the other yeah um, it's a very very different album and and um you can't Put it, you know, I remember when you guys came to me and, and, you said, and I said, okay, well, we, I need to know what genre this is. And I, listening back at it, it's, it's rock, it's metal, it's rap, it's, it's funk. It's like, what? how do you class it? Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's the problem. <laughs> well, I, think, yes. I, think that's what, I think that's what you get with a history of expanding nearly for, for 10 years of being inspired as creative musicians or artists or... You know. mm. Are we gonna? Are we actually yeah. gonna at some point hear the the earlier stuff? Yes. Um, <laughs> like, like once, once, a lot of the uh, the reason. The, the, sorry, Kim. 
but the reason I'm laughing is because <laughs> when we were discussing putting the earlier stuff on, the first co- point of conversation is maybe we should remix it. <laughs> In all fairness, was that came from you. You were the one who actually said that. And I'm, I'm very quick to agree with that comment. If anyone ever mentions remix, I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm sure I can do that. <laughs> Let's just hope it doesn't take another 10 years or 16 years. Yeah. And it's been. But at least the album that is out, the, the all and nothing that we that we have decided, it like what it says, it, it covers, it starts, some tracks date back to the late 90s and then some were the, lo- the very most recent songs we had written. Yeah. 13 tracks, you know, 45 minutes thereabouts. Um, album is All and Nothing and it's coming out the 19th of June, but you can pre-order it now and all the description in, below will be all the links and everything like that. So. 13 tracks. Okay, I'm just going to run through this. First Class Funky Hero. It's like, okay, Funk, Lifetime Partner featuring Melody K. Now, she's also, she also sang with David Beretta Owens in, in his solo album. Yes. Now, is that because, um, because he sang on um, Already There with you guys on this album? No, so I used to play drums for uh, Even Flow. And um, what? Now I was thinking of Even Flow. And then I also played drums for Dave's band Native. Oh, get out so, of it. You see, now I didn't know this. Damn. Okay. Even Flow. Shit, you guys used to play with Lithium a hell of a lot. Yeah, I think um, when they played with Lithium, they may have had a different drummer. Uh, but my connection with Dave and Mel was uh, obviously good friends and, you you know, uh, deepen that as well as playing in both their bands. So when it came, and then Craig from Pestroy, uh, Craig, uh, well, Pestroy and Plum had a very close friendship as two bands, and and we we had rehearsal rooms in the same building as well. So that lifetime partner was just bringing in some guest vocalists that we really uh, respected, which was Craig and Mel, and then Dave is on uh, already. Already there. there. Yeah, track 10. Yeah. Yep. I just want to uh, talk about the, the earlier stuff because I, I find it interesting that you releasing your last album first. I know you said it, whereas you said it's a, it's a combination of the last couple of years or, you know, 99 to 2004. But why not release the earlier stuff first and then deliver with the, the killer blow? But we did have another album called Malt that was a full length album. Um, it, it, you know, there was a whole nother history of, of 10 tracks. I think that, I think we, for all and nothing, it was the songs that we had, it kind of highlighted our history that we agreed with. Um, It massaged all the genres that we were inspired by, and it was tracks that we just couldn't let go. You know, over, over a period of 10 years or whatever, you know, Kevin and Troy, and myself were in a band called Instant Karma before Plum started, and then uh, then we got another drummer, and Troy was singing, and then you know it changed to a band called In Karma, and it was the same time that uh, Blue Chameleon were coming out, and B World, and uh, you know Vonderboom, mm. uh, Lithium Nine. You know, it was the the early 90s. It was like that mid-90 thing where things were peaking. It was all of a sudden, it wasn't really, people weren't really interested in finding their feet or going to clubs and listening to cover bands anymore. It was like we want this in, this inspiring creativity of this the South African uh, gem that that can call it a South African sound, and then we had this Durban sound, like this urban creep kind of sound, and then we had Cape Town with Lithium and Nine, and a whole variety of bands, you know. Uh, New and girls, then Joe, yeah. Nude Girls and Joburg had this own thing and it was such a beautiful time to be creating music mm-hmm. and there was no digital platform to share the stuff. It was all like, if you want to hear it, you know, go to the, the, the venue and buy the CD or watch it live. And it was, you know, from that to the crossover of the digital platform, you know, Napster came out and it was all this like thing that like all of a sudden you can download tracks and, they, you know. You think it's we hurt the industry? I, I, well, I, I, I think... For, didn't really hurt. I don't know if it hurt the industry. It just d- definitely didn't hurt us. But what happened to us over the eight years or whatever was that we had a huge influence of all the bands around us, including what was happening internationally and everything. And that's why Plum's sound changed so much 
mm. is because uh, not to say we were easily inspired, but we were always wanted to push the barrier all the time. We always wanted to be, you know, inspired by new sounds, new things. And because, you know, with Kevin in the studio and like really great engineer and, and getting these amazing sounds, we were always one, you know, we were always inspired to push this, this envelope, so to speak. And it kind of like pushed us in some directions. Maybe we shouldn't have gone in as a band. <laughs> For me, like we, you know, and uh, we got a little bit confused over the way. So that's why I think All and Nothing is a, tr a true example of yeah. where, 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 where we are. I think, it, like Wes was mentioning, <clears throat> that we had a band before Plum, the same members. And where that band sort of peaked was a very heavy hard rock almost metal sound and then we started plum and we kind of like i think we we used to get bored quickly as musicians yeah. so some bands like the stones kind of found their sound and then you know perfected it and that's what they do rage is rage they sound like rage we kind of like wanted wanted to the challenge of learning a new thing yeah and then once we had perfected it we were like yeah moving on yeah. now so like this, this the, the band before Plum was, if I look at it and I look at the last few songs Plum wrote, they're actually kind of similar. But yeah. <laughs> we went on this massive circle yeah. um, between them, doing everything we could find from rap to this, to trippy stuff, to chill stuff, to very complex rhythmic you know uh, i think we uh, we are we were three musicians who enjoyed the challenge of being a musician we like to to push ourselves and we we didn't uh, think about the audience too much in our creative process <laughs> but i mean you say that though because there is a video on your youtube channel or oh, is it your youtube have you guys got a youtube channel i put, I put it on mine so okay right yeah so, okay so that's where i found it that is trippy because I mean you said yourself you know it's like you guys went on like a bit of a trip and that is trippy I think that was the first word that I used when I went back to you, Kevin I was like fuck this is trippy shit man yeah why yeah well <laughs> Why, why is it trippy? What are you yeah, yeah, no, no. I mean, it's just an open-ended question, really. I'm, I'm, I'm just yeah. going, you know, because it, it's, it is very different. And it's not what you'd expect the sound to be of reflecting South Africa during that time, 96, 97, 98, 99. And that grunge was at, at the, you know, at its fore then, you know. Yeah, I think when we started Plum, we were kicking hard against grunge because we had yeah. been sort of grunging out just before we became Plum. And right. then, then we were like very hip hop rap was, was, was really taking um, our attention. And then kind of once we started to really get on top of that, hip hop became what it's become. And then we kind of like wanted to kick back against that because we never really, I don't know, I guess we were always trying to just stay one step ahead or at least out of the mainstream sort of sound. But uh, yeah. I, I, I don't really have much more to add. <laughs> okay. So I want to know, uh, Wes, who inspired you to become a musician? Sure. Well, you know, Kevin and I are cousins. And uh, so our, our dads are brothers. And I could go right back to when we used to visit my gran in Mayfair, Johannesburg, in the early, the, the late 70s. Uh, you know, they used to have my dad and my dad's brothers had a band room at the back of their house and we used to go and sit and watch them rehearse and from that moment that was an inspiration to to bring music into my life and to be part of it even though i only picked up the bass at 14 years old kev actually taught me how to play bass um he was already playing you know uh to be honest i picked up bass because a friend kev was a great guitarist already and and we had a friend that was playing drums and we wanted to start a band and naturally you need a bass player so i was like cool well, as you say, break, I've probably been playing for about a month longer than you. <laughs> <wasn't it? laughs> but still, you know, I mean, Kev's got a great No one chord. <laughs> it's it's 100% more than no chords. <laughs> <laughs> and then for me to really get inspired into play, bass was Les Claypool mm. from Primus. You know, I, I mean, I modded my Ebenezer bass, which I still have. I actually tracked it down. I sold it and tracked it down and bought it back. Because Whoa, I, that's I cool. It. Yeah, I put the EMG pickups in and, and all I wanted was, you know, this Primus kind of feel. And I was so inspired by Cypress Hill at the time. And all I really wanted to do is like play these crazy primacy kind of feeling riffs with the rapping, more melodic, like kind of rapping Cypress Hill, Temples of Boom kind of feel on top of it. Yeah. And um, then everything just inspired. And I think that's kind of, and I think what Kev was saying, you know, like we got bored very quickly. 
I think we felt challenged very quickly. If you follow Plum's progression from the time we started to the end, you can naturally hear, especially in our live performances, where where we were as musicians, the better we got as musicians, the more complicated the songs got. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, right. it was like we kind of incorporated our skills of the level we were with the songwriting abilities that we could do. And uh, Talk, the, talking yeah, of, of digital footprints, um, you guys don't have any other than a YouTube channel, and now you've got a, a Facebook page. Why did you guys embrace the the whole digital front earlier i think i think because the band broke up just as it was kind of taking off and like was said you know when we stopped gigging we just felt like well there's no point i i i think that things have changed so much trev so like um today you can you can be an artist you can essentially just create stuff entirely on your computer you can put it out digitally make videos do all of these things without ever getting on stage and still um be sort of respected and 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 have a certain level of success. how does that even, feel uh, it's neither good or bad i think it's actually great but it took you know we we came from a from a, a an era before that where you didn't try and record something until you had played 100 gigs and got people mm. at, at your show and everything was was about like also we, the, the 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 software was nowhere near what it is today so mm. uh, so you guys you had just to, missed you just missed out just i mean literally yeah so we, we we stopped as as i mean when when was this recorded was i'm trying to think back but people think, weren't streaming music yet it was still a hard copy i don't think streaming was even a thing when we finished this album mm. No, I mean, that's hectic. Uh, uh, yeah, just... I think the the Napster thing had just come out, and you could download. But streaming music, <laughs> no, but streaming, you know, like legally yeah. streaming, and and thinking yeah. things like uh, Apple Music and Spotify, they no. don't exist. No. They definitely no. didn't exist. Yeah, you know, even YouTube. But I mean, the streaming now. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> Your album will be. You know, there's a. <laughs> that's the weirdest thing. <laughs> there's a whole uh, gap in the 96 to 2002 South African music scene digitally. You know, I could name, you know, so many bands that uh, were huge at the time and there's no, even though they might be a slight digital platform, there's no real documentary of them. You know, there's, there's, um, there's beautiful bands. You know, like in Sugar Drive, and Sugar Drive were a great mm. band at the time. And even though there's not, there is a digital footprint with them. There's not like a huge documentary hype about them you know hats off go for me with with bands like wonderboom and and uh, springback new girls who pushed right through the whole transformation of you know analog to digital to to footprints you know but you know bands like be well blue chameleon you know battling to think of any now right you know the fetish you know things yeah there's so many beautiful bands out there that almost deserve that little bit of recognition, but that's kind of like a ghost spot in the whole place of, of uh, recognition. Somebody actually needs to take an undertaking and, and, and get out there and do a documentary of the, of the history of South African music between like, like almost, almost 85 to 2000 and even maybe 2010, yeah. because like you said, you could the, go all that, yeah, yeah. I mean, shit, there's a lot of stuff that, but that's a hell of an undertaking that. Yeah, it is. I mean, um, Ross, the drummer from Fetish and you, uh, you you obviously know Ross. He he started it, and I think he didn't get very far. <laughs> yeah, but I can imagine trying to track everybody down and and get permission yeah. to use all their music. Oh God, no! You know, no. I mean, we've I've got videotapes of us when we were on what's it called, like a, a press show that they had on Mnet called Live at Live at Five, being yeah. interviewed by John Flissness. Yes, and yes, we. Yeah. You know, we we rapping live on TV. You know, these three. I mean, I still remember. I can't remember his name. He worked for the Mail and Guardian. Guardian, Kev. I don't know if you remember his name. You know, like everyone was so shocked. Like these three, and and I'm sorry, it's like it sounds terrible to say it now, but these three white guys rapping. You know, like what are they doing from Joburg? These three white guys rapping, and it was quite a little bit of a hype. You know, we got nice playlisting from Five FM, and and a lot of articles written, and we were on TV and everything. But something with Plum just never exploded, and, and, and that was always kind of a mystery to me. We worked really hard. Maybe it had something to do with what Kev said earlier is that we didn't really pay too much attention to the audience and it was all really not to say a self-indulgent experience but it was 
very much. I would, I, I would, I would say totally self indulgent. Like he was just trying to be kind and diplomatic. Yeah, we step together. We'd like play a gig. You know, if the set would kill, the crowd would love it. We would never repeat that, which was really silly in hindsight. Like, okay, you had a winning formula, but we needed to to shuffle the deck each time. And yeah. only after playing with other bands, after Plum, you know, being in all these other bands, I realized like a lot of bands, they write a set and then if it works, they kind of stick to that set for a year almost. Yeah. Um, and it's rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. And we just never did that. I don't think ever once did we do that. No. Yeah. But I think that's that also, like you were saying earlier, it also brings down to the fact that you guys got bored. Very quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Jeep is How can you but be in the, a band? Playing in Plum was amazing. I, I have never felt the same feeling. And I've played, you know, a lot of shows with a lot of different artists, some great ones. But Plum was unique. It's, uh, being on stage with Plum was a unique experience. And, and people will hear that when they, when they get their album on their preferred digital platform they'll they'll hear that it's a very eclectic um, album different tracks all around and everything but i want to touch on the earlier stuff once again kevin you and i were speaking off where while waiting for Waz to come in are we going to get a new release of the older stuff was what do you think do i have to do are we going to remix it <laughs> or are we gonna let it go as it is uh you know i, I i'm at the stage where where i <laughs> i'm happy to let things go it is what yeah. it is. It was, you yeah. know. I would be I would be keen to to really release the very first the tapes that we actually took on tour with us called Hop and Hop, where you can hear the actual rawness of where Raw, what we were. Maybe maybe by. that would be easier for us. In fact, that's a good idea. Is to instead of saying okay, and this is another album, be like, and this is the back catalog of yeah unreleased stuff. Boom, yeah. there it is, one yeah. big package. Yeah. more and dirty I mean and we, we can we can release up to 36 tracks so I mean maybe put everything together yeah. into one maybe big massive release good idea. maybe awesome. that is a good idea uh, maybe a B-sides uh, compilation or something yes yeah that would probably I mean I've even got some recordings of us live in the studio uh, or yes. in the band room well, you, yeah, you heard it here first, folks. They're going to release a 36 track. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's going to take another 16 years to master and whatever. Yeah. Uh, it would have to be mastered because it's coming off. Oh, uh, bloody sensor. hell. There we go. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, Trev, and thank you for, for getting us on this platform. And thank you for reawakening Plum. You know, I mean, I was looking at Martin Schofield's comment the other day that he put on the YouTube channel that you were speaking about and he was like this is so cool so be so like before it's time and there was that track drowning you know and yes like when I listen to the album all and nothing I still get inspired I still listen to it and I'm still like wow this is such a like such a cool album you know? it is and I, it's and, very good and it still stands today that's the thing and you know you know you've got a good yeah. album if it stands up to today's music and it does I think as well you know as we had released it, as Kev mentioned, we, we did one or two or like a tour leg of it. And then unfortunately the band broke up and that that was a little bit, it was hard to take at the time. And it was kind of like, well, if, if that's the way it is, we're just going to end it. And you've kind of just poked at it and, and, and reignited it. And yeah, very grateful for that. Yeah, well, shit, no, I'm the one that's grateful. Thank you very much for the opportunity to do it. But the next question and the final question of this chat is, is there going to be anything new? That excites me and I can say, yes, there definitely is. Woo! Yeah. All right, cool. Yeah. And I'll, I'll ditto Kev's words there, yeah? Okay, so who's going to be in the oh, band? Sure. Because uh, Troy's kind of, what, he's like sort of, is he going to be involved? I think, well, yeah, unfortunately, the reality is Troy can't really be involved the way he, you know, the way he is with his living situation he's off the grid you know quite far away the internet mm -hmm. is not strong where he is um, if we can get him in on a track or two absolutely we'd love to do that the hardest thing about uh, doing Plum moving on I guess was uh, Plum was the sound of the three of us um, yeah. It was really a triad and, and everyone was like a point in the triangle and, and it worked. But I do think that, you know, Warren and I can definitely put stuff together and include Troy where and when he can uh, be a yeah. part of it. And I think that's probably going to happen before I remaster 36 tracks. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say, please to... don't, don't, don't yeah. let it be another 16 year wait, please. Yeah, I can't yeah, yeah, that, wait, wait. I mean, what, what Kev has said is that excites me, you know, and what Kev said previously is that, we, you know, when we were recording, it's not the same way as it is now. Like, there's nothing wrong with Troy coming up to Joburg for a weekend 
a couple of weekends recording some tracks, some drums and some vocals and Kevin, I carry on, you know. And also just to highlight what Kevin said is that Plum was definitely the sound of the three of us. And I think that was a, a huge reason why we didn't carry on with the band is that it was too difficult to replace one of us. You know, at times we were chopping and changing the vocals so much and our style of playing and the style of writing, it, it, it was under the care of Plum. It wasn't even under the care of us individually. It was, it was under the care of this, these three musicians that had gotten to love and trust each other so much with each other's music and skills and passion that that is the creation that Plum made. Well, I am for one very, very excited. Um, when, I, when I heard the album, I was like, damn, this is, this is very different. It's very off the wall. It's very heavy. It's very light. It's very pop. It's very funk. It's very everything. And, uh, and, and I love the title, All and Nothing. You know, it pretty much sums it up, really. So... Uh, from me to you, thank you very much for um, joining in the chat uh, today to um, discuss the album and its release. And that will be coming out on the 19th, I believe I said. Uh, yep, 19th of June. You can pre-order it now. Um, releasing through DistroKid. So uh, the link will be in the description below. And to your new Facebook digital footprint channel, you can go there and find out what the guys are up to and the release. Don't expect many updates because they don't tend to be on there a lot. So I'm, thankfully, I'm, I'm in charge of that a little bit. So with your permission, I'll keep that going. And, keep it going. Um, and I, I, I want to try and send you some stuff. I think that, uh, <laughs> you know, it was. We, can, we can dig out some old stuff and, and send it to you. Yeah, if you have, yeah, if you <laughs> got some more video stuff. footage, you know, we can always yeah. mix the, the new songs over some live footage and, and not new songs, but off this album, if there's any footage that... Yeah. Yes. mastered with good sound then there we go we can make it happen <laughs> and keep things alive and keep it moving forward thanks Trevor. thanks so much Trevor. all righty kevin was thanks yeah. very much man guys um keep well thanks, keep safe you too, all righty cheers all cheers.